Hello, my name is Cindy and welcome to this video. So today we are going to be talking about the library. So if you're following me and my channel, or if you see me on Facebook, you will know that recently I became a library trustee in my town. And so that just before that, you know, for like a year before that, I had been going to my library and the, they have trustees in our area and they have trustee meetings once a month. So I was going to the trustee meetings and asking lots of questions about the library. When my kids were younger, we used to go to the library quite frequently. We homeschooled and the library was a great extension of our homeschool. My younger kids would go to story time and that was really fun. They would hear stories and they would do crafts. And every summer we had the summer reading program where the kids would go to the library, of course, and they would get their picture taken for a little activity and they would read books and they would get prizes at the end of the summer. And usually at the end of the summer, they had a special event. I can remember one year they had a woman who sang songs like children's songs to the kids. It was really great. One year we had a magician that was really great. And the kids get prizes at the end of the summer for participating in the summer program. And there had been a few years, the last few years that I kind of stopped going to the library for various reasons. And unfortunately, my younger kids don't really read quite as much as my older kids did. But I still love the library. And the library is not just for children. The library is supposed to be for all ages. And it's supposed to be a great resource, um, even a place to go to study quietly. Uh, we have computers. You can look things up on the computer. I know people have looked for jobs on the computer. Usually the librarian or the people at the desks there, they are knowledgeable and they know how to help patrons in various ways. Our library also has six museum passes and several of them are within the state and maybe a couple, uh, we're trying to get the aquarium, Boston Aquarium Library Pass um, purchased by our library right now. But there are other passes that are really great and you can use those passes to go to museums and special places around the state for either free or reduced price. So that's really great. Now, within the last year, I realized that our library is very good about buying whatever books patrons want. So I didn't realize this way back when. I actually bought a lot of books myself. My kids even bought their own books with their own money at times. They built up their own collections. But at our library, they are pretty good about if somebody asks for a book, they will either purchase it, look for interlibrary loan, and, uh, you know, really try to meet the requests of the patrons. So if you are interested in, you know, reading a book, check with your library first. You could probably do that for free. There are also many books that are now online. There are many uh, apps that you can listen to books. Uh, of course, you know, the Kindle and the Nook. But there's also the Lib app, which is all of the books in, I know for our Libby app, it's all the books in the state. And they have all the books. Well, they don't actually have all the books. They have many books that are in the state. And you can go to the Lily app, Libby app and you can kind of check it out and you can keep it for like a couple weeks and then it just disappears. So it's actually a free way to listen to books with your phone or whatever uh, other device you might have. So that is a really great resource as well. There are lots of free ways to listen to books and to learn information. I have even gone to YouTube to listen to some books. Not every book obviously is on YouTube because they are copyrighted, but there are some books that are on YouTube that you can listen to. Actually, I think I listened to 1984 on YouTube for free. So, yeah. So, but today I wanted to talk to you about the Carnegie Library. 
And I would like you, if you've never been to my channel before, if you could give this video a thumbs up and if you could subscribe to my channel, I would really appreciate it. I plan to bring more information about libraries, help for teachers, and just life skills videos coming up in the future. I would like to get to 1,000 subscribers by the end of the year. So please help me out by subscribing and maybe share share my channel with a friend. Thank you so much. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the Carnegie Library. Now, our library in our town is a Carnegie Library, and I really had no idea what that meant. So I'm going to share my screen, and I'm going to, I just did a search, and, you know, the quickest thing that comes up is the Carnegie Library on Wikipedia. So here we go. A Carnegie Library is a library built with money donated by Scottish American businessman and the philanthropist Andrew Carnegie. A total of 2,509 Carnegie Libraries were built between 1883 and 1929, including some belonging to public and university library systems. 1,689 were built in the United States, 660 in the United Kingdom and Ireland, 125 in Canada, and 25 others in um, other countries, okay? At first, Carnegie libraries were almost exclusively in places which he had a personal connection, namely his birthplace in Scotland and in the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area, his adopted hometown. Yet beginning in the middle of 1899, Carnegie substantially increased funding to libraries outside these areas. As Carnegie Library's funding progressed, very few of the towns that requested a grant committing to his terms for operation and maintenance were refused. By the time the last grant was made in 1919, there were 3,500 libraries in the United States, nearly half of them Carnegie Libraries. Carnegie started erecting libraries in places with which he had personal associations, and the first was in Allegheny, Pennsylvania. The first Carnegie Library to open in the United States was Braddock, Pennsylvania, nine miles up the Monongalia River from Pittsburgh. Okay, and initially, Carnegie limited support to a few towns in which he had personal interest. But of course, as we just read, he branched out. To this day, Carnegie's Free to the People libraries remain, remain Pittsburgh's most significant cultural export, a gift that has shaped the minds and lives of millions. Architectural critic Patricia Lowry. So it's very interesting that he gave money to towns all over the United States. I'm going to kind of um, read down here to the library buildings were constructed in a number of styles, including Beaux Arts, Italian Renaissance, Baroque, Classical Revival, Spanish Colonial, to enhance their appearance as public libraries. Scottish Barone was one of the styles used for libraries in Carnegie's native Scotland. And Carnegie's grants were very large for the era. And his library for philanthropy is one of the most costly philanthropic activities by value. Have you ever heard of the Carnegie Libraries and do you have one in your town? Background, books and libraries were important to Carnegie from his early childhood. And in his autobiography, Carnegie credited Anderson with providing an opportunity for working boys that some people said should not be entitled to books. So, you know, he was reaching out to those who were less fortunate to acquire the knowledge to improve themselves Carnegie's personal experience as an immigrant who, with help from others, worked his way and became wealthy, reinforced his belief in a society based on merit, where anyone who worked hard could become successful. This conviction was a major element of his philanthropy or philosophy of giving in general. His libraries were the best known expression of this philanthropic goal. In 1900, Carnegie granted funds to build the Anderson Memorial Library in memory of Colonel James Anderson at the College of Emporia. All right, so here we have his formula. Nearly all of Carnegie's libraries were built according to the Carnegie formula. 
which required financial commitments for maintenance and operation from the town that received the donation. Carnegie required public support rather than making endowments because, as he wrote, an endowed institution is liable to become the prey of a clique. The pl public ceases to take interest in it, or rather never acquires interest in it. The rule has been violated, which requires the recipients to help themselves. Everything has been done for the community instead of its being only helped to help itself. Okay, so Carnegie required these things of the elected officials and the local government to demonstrate the need for a public library, to provide the building site, to pay staff and maintain the library, to draw from public funds to run the library, not use only private donations, annually provide 10% of the cost of the library's construction to support its operation and pro provide free service to all. So Carnegie assigned the decisions to his assistant, James Bertram. And the effects of the Carnegie's philanthropy coincided with a peak in new town development and library expansion in the U.S. By 1890, many states had begun to take an active role in organizing public libraries, and the new buildings filled a tremendous need. It was also a time of rapid development of institutions of higher learning. Interest in libraries was also heightened at a crit crucial time in their early development by Carnegie's high profile and his genuine belief in their importance. So he goes on to show the design. And according to the many libraries that gone in, they have different designs and different kind of flavors to kind of show the town that they're in, kind of like reflect what the town is like. And so I just thought this was interesting because as I was questioning my own director and librarians, I got the information that we have a Carnegie library in our town, which means that we are, we have to be committed. We took the money and we have to commit to continuing this library. So criticisms are that while libraries gifted by Carnegie was certainly a valuable cultural asset, they weren't without their critics, obviously. That's always the way, right? First Secretary of the Iowa Library Commission, Alice Taylor, criticized the use of Carnegie funding for extravagant buildings rather than providing quality library services. Okay, so everybody's going to have their own little thoughts on that. But I think we can all agree that it's kind of neat to have a free resource for information in our town. Well, it's kind of free for the people that use it, but in our town, the taxpayers continue the legacy. So continuing the legacy, there's more information. Here's some pictures of Carnegie libraries. Uh, let's see, Oklahoma, Ohio, Texas, New Zealand, Ireland, West Tampa Free Public Library, Tampa, Florida, California, St. Petersburg, Florida, and California, Serbia. So now we're going to go on to another screen. I'm going to stop with this one, and I'm going to show you a screen that shows a list of the Carnegie Libraries and how much money was donated. I think that's really interesting. So we're going to share the screen. And we're going to show the list of Carnegie libraries in the United States. All right. So we have Alabama. So Carnegie, wow, 14 libraries, five of them academic, $282,000. So definitely different amounts. Arizona, 64000 California. 121 public grants, 142 public libraries, two academic, $18.99, $2,000,000. Wow. <laughs> That's a lot. Okay, Colorado, 27 public grants, 35 public libraries, and over $700,000 for the grants. Okay, Indiana, $2,000,000, $2.5,000,000, Iowa, $1.7,000,000. Louisiana, 380,000. Okay, New Hampshire. Okay, here we are. New Hampshire, nine public grants, nine 
libraries, uh, one, what does it say? One academic library and 1902. So New Hampshire was given $154,000 in 1902. Now when we click on New Hampshire, we get the libraries that we have in New Hampshire. And we have Berlin got 17,000. Um, let's see, Claremont. Okay, we can click on this and get a picture. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, there it is. So that's one structure. Um, Dover, Dover is a pretty good sized town now. It's just growing bigger now. Um, Claremont is kind of a smaller town. Uh, Franklin, Lebanon, Littleton, Raymond. This is where I live and this is our public library. And that's pretty much what it looks like right now. Although it does need some painting right now. <laughs> But that's it. That's our library. Our library's a little small and we got $2,000 and it opened in October 1st, 1908. This library was significantly expanded in 1993. We have one director and I'm not sure how many other workers we have there. We do have three trustees that make decisions for our library. And then in New Hampshire, we have New Hampshire College of Agriculture and Mechanical Arts. And that's that's really cool. So it looks like some of them have the, you know, the arch doorways and the pillars in the front. But ours is very basic for our town. We have a small town. And um, as you can see, it's a smaller amount. So what I was told is we have a Carnegie Library, which means that we cannot close our library. Like we have to keep our library open because we made a promise. We took the money and it's promised that we will keep the library open and that we will offer free resources to our community. And I don't think that is a difficult request, right? So in our library, we have, oh, <laughs> I can't even tell you how many books, but we do have a pretty small library. And so we're working on just providing the best resources for our town. So I would just like to just give you some information, check and see if your town has a Carnegie library in it. It's kind of fascinating how the libraries were installed in the United States around the 1900s and how they are continuing today. A lot of libraries today offer books, but they also offer a lot of um, digital resources, audio books, uh, videos. I know our library has a telescope and I have looked online to see what all different libraries do. And I saw that in Alaska, there's one library that has like stuffed animals <laughs> for, I guess, for kids that want to do biology, you can go and maybe get like a stuffed deer or something or a stuffed beaver and you can kind of study them. And I know my library, when I lived in Wisconsin, we had a whole wall full of sewing patterns and you could go in there and you could pick a sewing pattern. I can remember one year I had three little girls and I picked the sewing pattern and I brought it home and made three little dresses and brought the pattern back. So I did, saved a little money um with the sewing pattern there is also a copier copy machine at our library there is the interlibrary loan system where you can get books from other libraries by just making a request and they will make sure that you get it um, at our library we also have story time and we have games and activities for the kids there's like a lego club and other get togethers for the patrons in the community we also have a librarian who does, uh, what do you call it? Trivia night. <laughs> she does a trivia night and that's really exciting. She also has had a civil war reenactment group come and talk to people. And she also had a homeschool gathering one time where somebody came and talked all about homeschooling. So this is a resource that your town and your community pays for 
And so I would just kind of like to put a bug in your ear to get more involved in your community and to do what you can to make your library the best it can be. So thank you so much for watching this video. Did you learn anything new? Did you already know all about the Carnegie libraries? Do you have one in your town? I would love to hear what you have to say about what you think about your library and libraries in general. Thank you for watching and I hope that you will come back for more videos like this. Thank you so much. Have a great day.